distinguished uh, participants, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome you and to thank you for taking time to participate uh, in this webinar on urban sanitation challenges, case studies from Africa and Asia. My name is Hezekiah Pire. I lead the water and sanitation team at UN Habitat in Nairobi, and I will be your moderator. This webinar is jointly organized by UN Habitat and IWA. Uh, it focuses on inspiring examples of cities in Africa and Asia, uh, Wagadugu in Burkina Faso, Dhaka in Bangladesh, Nakuru in Kenya, and Hanoi in Vietnam that have taken effective measures to deal with wastewater and fecal sludge. It is also an opportunity for us to concre concretize our ongoing discussions on citywide inclusive sanitation approach in international events, together with our partners, IWA, EWAG, SOAS, uh, the Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor, WhatsApp, and the Africa Water and Sanitation Association, among others, especially on how to bring sanitation to the heart of urban planning and development. Sanitation remains on the fringe of urban development. Many urban policies, legislation, and strategies rarely prioritize sanitation as a critical public service. Many cities and human settlements are therefore sprouting and rapidly developing without due attention to wastewater and fecal sludge management. Now to highlight the magnitude of this challenge and also to showcase ongoing actions, UN Habitat published a global report on sanitation and wastewater management in cities and human settlements in June of last year. Uh, during our second UN Habitat Assembly held here in Nairobi, Kenya. The global report is part of our ongoing program on scaling citywide since 2020 uh, with the support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, this global report has mapped 18 cities with five in-depth case studies covered in the report. And today we have the privilege of sharing with you uh, five, uh, four of these uh, case studies. Now, before I start, uh, we have housekeeping and ground rules. So this webinar uh, will be recorded uh, with your permission, and uh, it will also be made available on demand on the IWA Connect Plus platform and the IWA network website with presentation slides and other related information. Uh, participants are advised to use the chat box. Uh, participants are advised to use the chat box for general requests and for interactive activities. Uh, but you use the Q and A box to send questions to the panelists, and we will be answering uh, these uh, questions during uh, the discussions. So let's go to the agenda of of the meeting today, and we are honored to to have distinguished speakers who will present uh, these four case studies uh, from Ouagadougou, from Dhaka, Nakuru, and Hanoi, uh, which are contained in, in the global report. And the idea is to illustrate specific challenges in these cities and emerging best fit approaches related to sanitation and wastewater management, uh, providing evidence and underlying rationale for public policy response uh, in these cities. Uh, to start us off and to set the context, uh, we will be joined by our keynote speaker, Dr. Abhishek Sankara Narayan, who is a research and a project manager at EWAG Switzerland. And I will be introducing uh, the rest of the speakers as they speak. So Abhishek, you have the floor and you have seven minutes. Over to you. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, kind introduction, uh, Pire. So I'm equally excited about this webinar because uh, we are going. We are starting to see what CYs or citywide inclusive sanitation means on the ground. But in order to, as as Pire said, to set the context of what is citywide inclusive sanitation for those who have not heard of this term before, and how did we actually uh, uh, 
find ourselves in in this uh, uh, journey towards CYS um, and and really understand the evolution of urban sanitation as a development agenda, I, I would like to just set the scene by uh, providing a little bit of uh, context. This rapid urbanization is going to mean that by 2050, two thirds of the world is going to be urban. And the, the rapid urbanization that we are witnessing all across uh, uh, the world is particularly happening in cities of South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. And with rapid urbanization, what often accompanies is poor access to water and sanitation service, whether it's the hanging toilets in Bangladesh or, or whether it's flying toilets in, in uh, some slums in Kenya, or whether it's simply unusable toilets in, in Peru, over 1.75 billion people uh, uh, living in urban areas do not have access to uh, safely managed sanitation. And added to this, about 80% of all the wastewater that's being discharged into the environment is also uh, um, not having any form of treatment. So this twin problem uh, makes urban sanitation particularly complex and, and not necessarily a piece of cake as, as you see on the, on the, on the right. Uh, because of multiple issues and, and various pressures that are simultaneously uh, happening. For example, uh, there are different issues with respect to urbanization, whether it's migration, um, slums and the tenure insecurity that comes along with it, population density, and the inequities of urbanization that uh, are heightened um, in, in, in urban sanitation is, is a major issue. And the other, uh, other thing we need to remember is when we talk about sanitation, it is not a siloed topic. We need to deal with water supply, solid waste, stormwater, public health, and urban planning, and just general environmental health departments in order to actually uh, um, make sustainable interventions in uh, the field of urban sanitation. And every time I say urban sanitation, I hope what comes to your mind is not just the infrastructure, because there are multiple dimensions to urban sanitation. We need to think about the sociocultural aspects. Of course, the engineering aspects are equally important, but also the economics, the institutional uh, accountability mechanisms, and so on. But the good thing is, Urban sanitation as a global agenda has been evolving since the late 60s. And in order for us to understand CYS, it's important to understand the historical context that has led to its emergence. Between the 1970s to uh, 2020s now, there have been several key moments that led uh, uh, to this evolution. Uh, it's been a slow but a steady change um, that have been focusing towards context-specific sanitation solutions rather than this uh, one-size-fits-all sewer-based approach. And sanitation planning has been getting more and more emphasis, especially in the last two decades, where we've been thinking about sanitation planning to be strategic, to be participatory with uh, the local communities, for it to be multidisciplinary, as I previously just mentioned, and of course, for it to be citywide. So in terms of what were then the key moments, there, there have been several, but the ones that I want to highlight are three. In 2000, we had the Bellagio principles on sustainable sanitation, which actually brought all of these different uh, uh, um, uh, aspects that I just mentioned with respect to participatory planning, low cost technologies and so on. But in 2010, the human right to water and sanitation enshrined the importance of sanitation at the global level uh, um, as a human right, as a fundamental right itself. And of course, the SDG uh, helped us rethink sanitation from merely uh, um, um, an infrastructure perspective towards this ladder perspective and thinking about it from a service-based approach. And that is exactly what some of the advancements in urban sanitation have, have led us to. The MDG era, as, as I just uh, um, mentioned, what, what was a precursor to the SDGs, focused only on toilets, access to toilets. But in the SDG era, we have this ladder-based uh, um, thinking where we are thinking about uh, safely managed sanitation as a service outcome, not rather as a, not only as an infrastructure outcome. 
Similarly, there have been several other advancements in the technological front, whether it's uh, advancements in the knowledge on fecal sludge management, whether it's advancements towards container-based sanitation as a sustainable uh, um, service approach, or whether it's these different small-scale sanitation or decentralized sanitation approaches. There have been several uh, developments that have happened in the technological front. And what accompanied this is also the development of resource recovery uh, technologies, which also brought the thinking of different business models and the, um, the possibility of involving private sector and thinking of sanitation, not just as a public service, but also thinking about how can private sector actually be involved in this, in this process and creating a sanitation economy. And finally, on the planning front, uh, there have been several useful planning approaches and tools that have been developed, which have uh, uh, greatly helped uh, uh, think about sanitation in a holistic perspective. So all of these different threads combined led to the emergence of CYs. And what is unique about CYs is really the consensus that it created between research institutions, development banks, philanthropic partners, NGOs, UN institutions, and of course, governments themselves. And this has led, led to a sort of a paradigm shift in the way we approach citywide inclusive sanitation. Now I've use the term CYs and uh, uh, citywide inclusive sanitation several times. So what does it actually mean? So this is sort of a wordy definition of saying that it's an approach where everybody in the city is treated equally to uh, receive uh, improved sanitation services through both sewered and non-sewered systems without any contamination to the environment. Now that is a wordy definition, but it's simply a representation of the complexity of CYs. However, if we want to understand it in more uh, operational means, it's then best explained through the Manila principles, where we split CYs into six main uh, uh, principles. And I'm not going to go into detail of uh, each and every one of these, but just to highlight equity as an important uh, aspect where we have to focus on, on outcomes where uh, uh, communities which could be marginalized based on gender, socioeconomic dimensions, etc., benefit from equitable sanitation. Similarly, we're thinking about mix of different technologies. The, the uh, uh, approach towards equal service outcome could take different forms. It could have a mix of technologies and it could have a mix of service or business models itself. And of course, we need to do this by uh, um, having a comprehensive planning approach where we are involving stakeholders, we are thinking beyond the five-year political cycles and going with an incremental perspective uh, and also accounting for other urban development goals. So these uh, are, are some of the most fundamental things that we need to think about when, when uh, uh, we are operationalizing CYs. And another framework that is particularly uh, uh, prominent and, and very useful when we decide to create uh, monitoring uh, indicators and, and outcomes is the CY service framework itself. And the UN Hab Habitat uh, Global Report follows uh, some of these uh, um, service framework approach to kind of structure the entire report. So why is CY this prominent? Uh, uh, or what what is the exact traction that it has gained over the past uh, six, seven years? Is that Today, CYS is really seen as the way forward in international development when it comes to urban sanitation projects. And, and, and the implementation of CYS projects has been widely streamlined. And in a recent portfolio review, we saw that more than $6 billion have been invested by various development banks and in development agencies on uh, uh, the CYS approach. And to support all this, there's been also a lot of research that's been done on CYs, which then has contributed to capacity development initiatives and also tools and planning approaches to design a, a CYs project on the ground. Now, we also uh, uh, just last month uh, concluded um, a state-of-the-art um, literature review on what has happened in CYs. And, and to just give you context, when I started research on CYs about six years ago, there was absolutely nothing written on CYs. And today I was uh, very surprised, pleasantly so, to see that more than 77 peer-reviewed research articles, policy briefs, et cetera, are actually uh, uh, around. And then when we went into some more details, we saw that there's a few different types of 
frameworks on CYs that exist uh, in no particular order. Uh, um, it, the one by uh, um, the World Bank, the Gates Foundation, Asian Development Bank, and Airwag are, are the ones that are emerged as uh, quite prominent. And although they have slight differences, they largely agree on the same uh, aspects of what I just previously mentioned in the Manila principles. And when we saw out of these 77 articles, what which topics are being largely covered, it became clear that the software aspects or the or the institutional aspects of CYs uh, actually got uh, the lion's share of what kind of research has been happening, uh, which is primarily on institutional regulations and accountability mechanisms and on planning. However, we also saw some uh, gaps in terms of how CYS actually presents its benefits to public health, to environmental health, to uh, uh, economics, and so on. These kind of uh, came out more prominently as the gaps, and how the governance of mix of different technologies can be organized is also something that we found very little uh, uh, ideas and, and literature on. And some key issues that have gained prominence in the last few years, uh, which still have to be incorporated into the CY's thinking is, is on climate change, on sanitation workers, and this whole topic of integration with other urban development agendas. And, and that's the, the last piece of uh, uh, information that I wanted to share is water supply, sanitation, and solid waste. These are three different uh, basic services that are very closely linked to each other. And in our products, between these three topics, and some of them are very significant. And when we think about operationalizing CYs, we need to take this uh, agenda uh, to really see how can we progress further in developing a sort of an actionable guidance for implementation. And there are various ways in which you can get involved with you know, if you have ideas for publications or MOOCs or webinars, please contact uh, uh, the IWA um, uh, staff or who kind of get you involved in the process. So thank you very much. And back to Pire. Thank you very much, uh, Abhishek, for that enlightening uh, keynote. Um, the participants um, will find time to engage uh, on some of the issues you have raised during the q and speaker. Yes. Uh, Mr. Harry Naivo Anderson Andrea Nessa, who, who is the Associate Professor of Water and Engineer and Environmental Engineering at uh, 2IE Burkina Faso. Yeah, the key data for the city of Ouagadougou. So Ouagadougou is uh, average is very low. So about more than 95% uh, of the population has access to non sewage sanitation. In terms of uh, institutional arrangement, so uh, is led by the ministry in charge of water and the sanitation and uh, the public uh, utility national office, office for water and sanitation, ONEA, is in charge of planning and also for service provision. Uh, there are also some private companies who are actors in the sanitation service provision. These are usually the emptying and transport for fecal sludge and uh, those who construct the toilet facilities. Informal settlement is shown in this figure. So you can have uh, the informal settlement uh, near part of the uh, picture. And uh, as uh, there is no settlements are not structured in formal areas. Uh, we used to have unsustainable construction and the accessibility is very difficult. So our work was focused on, uh, as uh, said in the title, uh, uh, to analyze the extending the sanitation service delivery in informal settlements. So these are service provision elaborated by the government of Burkina Faso. And the first one is the national constitution. So actually, the uh, Burkina Faso is the only French-speaking country in West Africa today to have integrated access to water and sanitation as well. In terms of national policy program for the period of 2006 to 2000, which to the national strategies, uh, unfortunately, there is sanitation in informal settlement in 
there are uh, strategical initiatives made from some national structure, like the Ministry of Housing, Urban Planning and the City, and the ONEA, sanitation, including sanitation programs of the concept of urban agglomeration instead of urban area to consider informal settlements in the development of water and sanitation services. So this specific strategy of the access to sanitation in Burkina Faso. And uh, so uh, there was the project, project was to subsidize household latrine. So uh, there was a new type of latrine that has been introduced. The particularity of this uh, kind of latrine is that uh, it is uh, so, uh, as we know, in uh, informal change in terms of organization in another one. And uh, there, are, there is also an initiative made by the ONEA who, who support the private companies who will build the latrine. So once, so if you are a private company, you, uh, each time you build the latrine, you will be given uh, about 500,000 of franc CFA, which is about eight uh, US dollars. So this amount is a little bit uh, low, but when you, for example, the, 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 the cost may be uh, important. And actually, there is a discussion to, 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 to improve, increase this, uh, this fees. Uh, one of the uh, initiatives also was made by the KFW, who support the ONEA uh, in terms of activity. And uh, this has really helped the ONEA to increase the number of people who have uh, sanitation access in the United To end my talk, so uh, based on that study, we, we just uh, analyze what are the the good model of sanitation services adapted to this informal settlement. So there are uh, four points we have uh, uh, highlighted. So uh, in terms of technology, on-site sanitation are the best areas. Uh, like the Lily Latrine allows for relocation in settlements with its modular design, it can be easily disassembled and move to a safer location. Uh, during the implementation also, there is a need of uh, always uh, have a continuous mapping and partnership with local actors. Because as I said, there is a many movement in these informal settlements. So we have to regularly map what are, what are the new organization of the city so we can in this area. And finally, uh, thanks also to the inclusion of the sanitation uh, access in the constitution. Uh, act now, uh, the, the informal manual empties the actors of sanitation actors, they are there. They are contributing to right? so now since last year there is a new uh, decree that uh, recognizes officially the uh, informal the, the manual in years and this is very important because it is the act of the uh, emptying are done by the manual employers. So these are the the information what access of sanitation to informal. Uh, Harry Naivo for sharing with us this experience from Ouagadougou. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Pritum Saha from the Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor, who will be speaking to our institutional and regulatory reform. Uh, Saha, you have seven minutes. Oh, thank you, Pire. Uh, so, uh, hi, this is Pritum here. I'm currently working with uh, urban, uh, Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor as their uh, manager for monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning. And I'm, I'm, I'm an urban planner by training and uh, by profession, I'm working with urban wash to, uh, uh, to see the uh, our findings uh, from Dhaka city uh, during our, which is uh, gained capital of uh, the country since 
10 years, uh, the population of the city has grown uh, 14 times, uh, which which results that 300, which results that uh, the 300 square kilometer city is now a home to 21 million people, and the population is continuously growing 3% uh, every year, according to. Uh, uh, former sources, uh, according to the informal sources, the uh, who is uh, designated to control the land use of the city says that 63% of the total population not by the uh, people living in the city. Uh, Dhaka was once a city of canals and rivers and five uh, migrant place uh, to establish their uh, their informal uh, housing known as slums, the slums right now if considered all the informal settlements and 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 low income housings the number might shoot up to 4 out of 10 so however as the migrants keep coming you can understand the the settlements keep growing and the number of canals has now reduced to 26 from 75 uh, throughout all uh, through, uh, as per uh, as per records of 2020 uh, so now Commonality among all of them. They were making West, uh, both solid West and human West, and the lack of infrastructure or facilities so that they can uh, dispose the West uh, in a, in a uh, proper manner. So, um, in, a, in a proper manner. So, the people living in informal housing uh, started uh, connecting their toilets with those canals and disposing their solid waste into those canals. As a result, the water flow, not only the number of the canals, but all the, the water flows also reduced and, and, and uh, kept uh, bringing uh, I mean, different kind of problems. Uh, soon after that, I mean, soon after this, it, things started happening, also started following the footstep of the people of the low income, uh, dwellers of the low income, uh, communities or low-income areas as uh, only 20 system so the rest had to be dependent on on site sanitation system and they started connecting their toilets with the canals and they started disposing their solid waste in those canals uh, as a result uh, the, the 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 water bodies and the flood plains were started getting affected and the utility dhaka wasa uh, designated to manage all these wastewater was not great in managing all those wastewaters. So, <clears throat> yeah, in 2017, uh, Bangladesh government standards, uh, which was absent, so the, nobody knew uh, for for ensuring the containment standard when a building uh, is is in is uh, is, is I mean uh, IRF in 2017. However, Dhaka back then already had hundreds of, and th hundreds of thousands of buildings with no standards and mostly disposing their uh, sludge and wastewater in the in the drains, which are not meant to carry all this type of waste. Uh, however, a lately happened event happened that all canals and drains and the management of those drains and canals uh, shifted from the utility Dhaka Wasa to Dhaka City Corporations, which is uh, which is uh, uh, now Dhaka City Corporation. Uh, there are two city corporations in Dhaka. Now they are managing those uh, drains and, and canals. And, and now they are creating awareness as th those institutions are uh, laid by public representative. They are very close to the uh, to the people, the dwellers. And they have uh, they have I mean, uh, uh, they have a good organogram uh, in each of the smallest administrative unit of this public awareness, creating awareness events, and they are trying to discourage people uh, to make some sort of, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, like uh, penalty and everything. And uh, the best thing is they are, the theory counts, which were solid waste and, and making a public demonstration to, to create further awareness. However, a large part of IRF FSM for Dhaka, and there are especially, uh, there are challenges, lots of challenges, but the, 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 the shift of the institutional uh, setup is uh, pushing us towards uh, the, this unpacking. But yeah, that's, there are still a lot to do. Uh, 
so I'm, I'm closing here. Uh, very much, uh, Pritum, for that um, a very um, informative presentation of forms uh, Now, before we move, having a short poll uh, to have, uh, inclusive urban sanitation, uh, the questions are being projected to the screen. The answer that uh, best responds to the question, uh, the question also holds to make sense, but uh, for those who are able to read them directly, kindly go ahead. We have five minutes uh, to respond to the following best described inclusive urban sanitation. You choose a single choice, a sanitation crisis, sanitation goal, everybody benefits, sanitation chain, progress required to achieve SDG sanitation targets. The rate of progress needs to quadruple, strong political leadership is necessary, mix of sanitation technologies from outside the country, invest agencies are required. The third question, which of the following do not describe the campaign and awareness efforts required for urban sanitation improvement? Number three, conducting targeted campaigns that emphasize the importance of personal and community hygiene uh, strengthening health clubs in schools, arresting people without toilets in their homes, and community engagement. I think you should go to, to the, 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 the four. What action can improve urban sanitation, particularly in on site sanitation, adopt the successful community led project, seaward networks, uh, country and high level win willingness? on inclusive sanitation, address inequity in sanitation provision. Good, so the first question, um, we have 75% uh, saying everybody benefits, 8% saying sanitation crisis, sanitation goal 4%, sanitation chain 11%, and climate adaptation 1%. Which of the following best describes inclusive urban sanitation. So one of the key principles of, uh, of uh, uh, citywide inclusive sanitation is that every everybody benefits from sanitation services. The next one, uh, yes. So which of this uh, uh, does not describe the progress required to achieve SDG sanitation targets? Uh, we have uh, used a mix of sanitation technologies from outside the country getting 50%, the rate of progress could, uh, needs to quadruple, 12%, strong political leadership is necessary, 9%, inaction brings greater uh, costs, 19%, investment can be a pathway, 1%, effect, effective coordination and regulation agencies are required, 9%. So the correct answer is a use of a use a mix of sanitation technologies from outside the country. That is the one that least describes the progress required to achieve uh, the sanitation targets. Number three, uh, which of the following does not describe the campaign and awareness efforts required for urban sanitation improvement? Two percent conducting targeted campaigns. 3% uh, strengthening health clubs in schools, 86% arresting people without toilets in their homes, distributing hygiene kits to vulnerable populations, community engagement and empowerment, 6%. So the correct answer is C, arresting people without toilets in their homes. And the last um, question is, what actions can least enhance current efforts to improve urban sanitation? particularly in Africa and Asia, 16% regulate on-site sanitation, 21% adopt successful community total-led sanitation approaches, invest in water and sanitation infrastructure to support seaward networks, uh, country and high-level winningness uh, on inclusive sanitation and addressing inequity in, in sanitation provision as 6%. The correct answer is uh, uh, C, investing in water infrastructure to support seaward networks. That list uh, describes um, what is required to enhance the current efforts to improve sanitation.
uh, in in Africa and and Asia. So thank you very much uh, for participating in the poll. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Emmanuel Owako from the Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor Kenya office. Uh, Emmanuel will be speaking on bridging the sanitation uh, data gap in Nakuru. And Emmanuel, you have 10 minutes starting now. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, hope you can hear me. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is Emmanuel Owako, uh, Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor uh, from the Global Office. Uh, acting head of global programs. So I'll be presenting on the data gap for on-site sanitation, uh, a case study that was done in Nakuru, Kenya. So Nakuru is one of the cities uh, in Kenya, northwest of Nairobi, and uh, one of the fastest growing uh, cities. Uh, and uh, within uh, the city, uh, it's it's the headquarter of one of the count uh, of the uh, county governments uh, that uh, was first to develop a countywide sanitation investment plan, and within that county we have uh, a local a local government on public utility uh, called Nawasco, that is Nakuru Water and Sanitation Company, uh, which has been given uh, or the, uh, the mandate through a devolved uh, function to be in charge of seward uh, and on-site sanitation across the uh, the county uh, within within the city of Na uh, of nakuru and uh, for it to uh, fulfill its mandate uh, one of the critical elements that uh, has been presented is the lack of data and uh, this is a lack of uh, sanitation data both seward and on-site sanitation and uh, for uh, for it to uh, to roll out uh, this mandate in a, in a good way, uh, the the utility has uh, up to date uh, information. Uh, for it to uh, roll this, uh, the utility needs up to date information on certain key metrics for sewerage services uh, with data which is readily accessible uh, through uh, an auto automated system. But to realize that the data on the on-site services is lacking, because much of the uh, cities uh, we have sewers and the on-site sanitation is still growing, and then the uh, for that data to be available is still a challenge. And then there is also the data that is critical for investment and service planning. For example, uh, you realize that the proportion of households uh, with access to pit latrines and even the septic tanks. Uh, within a given service area is not uh, that uh, the data is uh, is not well collected or not readily available uh, due to the fact that uh, that uh, that part of work is uh, is, 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 is 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 domiciled uh, with uh, various institutions so uh, where it does exist uh, that data you will realize uh, some are part in the Department of Public Health, which uh, which for a long time uh, before the evolution had responsibility on the on-site sanitation, and also uh, some with the utility. And uh, there is also the solid waste management that is also in the department, the departments uh, within the county government. So you find the data that is very critical for this service delivery has some level of limitation. And that creates such a, a challenge for the utility to, to 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 plan and also to do that accurate investment planning, and that's why this data gap remains key for on-site sanitation service. So, uh, in in when conducting this uh, case study, we we did realize that uh, there is a, a centralized data management uh, within the utility. Uh, that uh, uh, that is needed to be able to improve uh, service planning, and uh, in a collaboration effort uh, was uh, with uh, with the uh, a collaboration effort that was done with Wasre, uh, Aqua Consult uh, uh, through the funding of uh, Gates Foundation, uh, did pilot uh, the UKISAV tool that was designed to assist planners and service providers in mapping city level service coverage. Uh, costs and also uh, revenue models, and uh, in this modeling, uh, we really uh, the 
uh, the, it, it was about having uh, different models uh, being considered. And just as I mentioned, this was not work done by uh, WASA, but uh, it was we we participated in gathering the case study, but uh, Gates Foundation funded this, and therefore the pilot uh, developed uh, Nawasco's understanding of the need to centralize uh, information within the utility, so, so that there is accurate data uh, within the utility. And that uh, accurate data is also, if it is disseminated uh, to other respective uh, stakeholders, then it creates a, a better planning perspective. And uh, utility plays a critical role in the coordination uh, of the NACOSTE, which is one of the platforms for sanitation implementation within the utility, uh, within the, the city. And therefore, if uh, the NAWASCO is currently strengthening its MND systems across the utility departments and functions to, uh, to ensure that there is enhanced service planning. So some of the indicators that uh, this tool uh, picked uh, was uh, issues around uh, service coverage, uh, equity, sustainability, the safety of the service, but when it comes to the safely managed uh, fecal waste, uh, the investment part, which I've mentioned, and the issue of subsidy uh, where, uh, where it is required. So this, is, uh, this was a study that uh, was meant to bring forth uh, that investment planning with the models or scenarios, both in terms of on-site heavy investment, uh, mixed investment, if there is sewer and on-site, and then there is also uh, sewer uh, heavy investment. So it gives the utility the scenarios, and that is only possible when there is data and accurate data that is able to create uh, good models uh, for investment planning. As I mentioned, it's one of the counties that uh, first developed a countywide uh, sanitation investment plan, and then within the city where the utility operates, we still need that data for the utility to have a better planning uh, of its system. So the role of the MND and also the coordination of the partners of the stakeholders within the county and the utility remains uh, quite key to be able to have accurate data and also to inform the county-led uh, integrated plan that allocates budgets. And without, uh, without data, it becomes a bit of a challenge to really influence and position sanitation as an element that could be budgeted for. So, uh, those are some of the areas that uh, the need for data uh, is uh, helping the utility, and also this pile, this tool is likely to uh, to support the investment planning within the city, and also to inform uh, the countywide uh, implementation of the plan. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. I see that we are doing very well in terms of time. Uh, now, let me invite our final speaker, uh, T. Tui Bui, who is an R&D scientist as, at uh, Molea Inc. USA, who will be speaking to us on flood prevention through urban drainage systems in Hanoi, Vietnam. Welcome, T. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Pire, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Tui Bui. Uh, I'm going to present uh, the case study of Hanoi uh, with the topic of flood prevention via the urban drainage system. Uh, uh, let me start with the overview of the case study. Hanoi is the capital city of Vietnam. And you know, Vietnam is uh, like uh, located in the southeast of Asia, bordering with the China, Laos, and Cambodia. We have very long coastal line. And Hanoi cities um, have the population of 8.3 million. Uh, and in terms of the water and sanitation services, in 2010, it has been said that the water network coverage connection is about 42% in Puri urban area and around 71% in urban area. But recently, this number has been increasing up to like almost 60% for peri urban area and around 80% for urban areas. Um, the sanitation coverage is uh, more than 60% and about 29% of the wastewater, 2 to 8% of slush are being treated in the centralized system. 
Um, uh, mostly, uh, the Zurich uh, and drainage system in Hanoi are the combined system, which are uh, functioning receiving uh, the storm water and uh, uh, and wastewater, um, uh, yeah, and the and, and discharge them to the you know the the water basins. Uh, so, what are the problems of this case study? Uh, in fact, Hanoi is facing too many you know, challenges in the water and sanitation. And in a recent decade, the water pollution and urban uh, flooding are the major issues. As you can, as you know, that uh, Vietnam is uh, a tropical country, so we have like the very high annual rainfall. So that's why we uh, normally like we suffering from the flood for every like rainy season. As you can see in the photo, uh, the uh, surface water basin is being you know highly polluted because of the wastewater coming from the households living nearby the canal uh, discharge the uh, their domestic wastewater into the canals and also the uh, the wastewater has been uh, discharged into the sewer and after the sewers just 20 just 30 percent of it's being treated and the rest is like going to directly to the river so it's causing like very severe problem and pollution in the surface area in the surface water uh, three uh, several weeks ago, I believe it was in May 2024, there was a very heavy rain event uh, in Hanoi, causing very severe flood uh, in uh, in the cities, and most of the streets uh, in the cities just turned into rivers and causing some like severe problem for the traffic and the domestic activities. Uh, as a practice, uh, wastewater has been reused for the aquacultures and agricultures in the peri-urban of Vietnam. Uh, in the right map on the left, uh, uh, showing us the wastewater uh, fed areas in the districts of Hanoi, uh, and this the fisheries and rice cultivation in these districts. These districts supply a lot of uh, aquaculture and agriculture for the whole cities. And on the right photo, you can see how we reuse the wastewater for vegetable, uh, vegetable cultivation. Uh, there are, however, uh, lack of the safe reuse guidelines uh, from the policy and decision maker, making the reusing of the wastewater has been being very risky uh, for the human health because most of the pathogen and microbial uh, cannot be uh, treated really well uh, and it can accumulate into the aquacultures and agriculture products. So this is a problem. So we see the problem of the water pollution, of the like urban flooding, of the like wastewater reuse with the human, uh, with the with the uh, with the health uh, risk. And so what can be the solution? The first option can be uh, the managing of the wastewater and fecal slugs uh, by uh, taking. Uh, by considering the responsibility of the different stakeholders, uh, as you can see it's in the uh, in the figure, uh, we divide into uh, separate part. One is the sewer sanitation, and another one is the on-site sanitation. In terms of the sewer sanitation, the households uh, have to be involved with the connection uh, to the wastewater uh, to the drainage system. And Hanoi Sewerage and Drainage Company gonna be in charge of the uh, wastewater infrastructures. Including the wastewater, uh, including the sewerage system, the treatment facility, disposal and reuse, uh, and under the lead of the uh, Hanoi uh, sewerage and drainage company, a private company, which is a Fudian company, can uh, uh, take uh, their role on treatment and operating of the wastewater treatment plant in Hanoi cities. Uh, in terms of on-site sanitation, the households must have the septic tank, which we call is a containment to connect with the emptying and transporting and treatment and deposure from the Hanoi Urban Environment Companies in cooperating with the different private services providers to make sure that we have a better on-site sanitation. Also, this one is the technical um, aspect for how we can manage and how we can treat the wastewater and fecal slug. Of course, we need to have take into account with the economic aspect uh, and uh, the policy aspect. 
In terms of the industrials with water, recently there was a policy dialogue on bridging the policy and industry to close the loop of the industrial wastewater because in some area the waste the industrial wastewater has been connected with the uh, with the domestic wastewater and uh, we have to have a better way to manage the municipal wastewater to uh, prevent the flood in the cities. Um, it has been said that the sustainable urban drainage system uh, has been implemented in Hanoi through the different way, but the most uh, uh, the most proper way is like to the source, the pathway and the receptor controls. Um, in terms of the source uh, control solution, rainwater is, is like, please to keep in mind that Vietnam is a capital, uh, is a tropical country, so we have a lot of supply rainfall uh, like every year. We have to make sure that we manage the rainwater very well. And rainwater is actually started to be harvested from the micro to medium scale. And uh, to for flood mitigation, as you can see in the left, this is like very big uh, underground rainwater tank with a volume of two thousand uh, cubic meter. We can be able to um, uh, to mitigate the flood in like a certain street and area of the Hanoi. Uh, normally, without this uh, rainwater tank, the um, uh, the um, the flooding period is around eighteen hour one eight uh, hours. But when we have this tank, the flood uh, flooding period is just uh, two hours. So basically, like we you know, we can mitigate a lot of like flooding in the certain areas of uh, Hanoi. In the right side, you can now see a case study in the campus, which is like uh, actually I graduated from this university. Uh, the rainwater has been harvested from the rooftop and it can be used for the flood mitigation inside the campus. And also the rainwater afterward is gonna be treated to be the drinking water supply to the student, teachers and the visitors of the campus. This is a very good way for us to can can save the water. And trust me, when we have the rainwater for drinking, um, yeah, the, the 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 taste of the water gonna be better than the tap water and bottled water actually. Uh, the next approach of having uh, implementing the uh, sustainable urban drainage solution is the pathway and receptor controls. Uh, after um, uh, since. Uh, after 2008, uh, we have very severe flooding in the cities and killing like 18 people inside the city. So Hanoi spent a lot of money on uh, bu on building and constructing a flood uh, pumping station, which is a, in a pumping station, and uh, to um, to mitigate the western uh, the, the flood in the western part of Hanoi. And uh, in Hanoi, there are four key rivers, which is like the symbol of Hanoi actually. But uh, however, yeah, we, we are not lucky because the four rivers are being like dead, and there are a lot of uh, pollution in the, uh, for the water. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like effort on improve the water quality in uh, improve the water flow to tackle the water pollution for the four rivers in Hanoi. In 2020, World Bank uh, spread out the policy note yeah, to recommend us how we can invest uh, the sustainable uh, urban drainage system in Hanoi uh, because the target is Hanoi should become a water pollution and flood free city by 2015. Uh, in order to that, we have to, you know, take into account with a certain activity, with a certain assumption uh, and you know, have the like, very good outcomes. The activities uh, based on the one bank uh, recommendation should focus on the infrastructures, the river flows, uh, the green in the infrastructures and also like, you know, regulation and institutional reform uh, to make sure that we have reduced risk of the flooding in the urban areas to reduce the wastewater distrust and pollutant load in the rivers and also um, uh, to make sure that you know the flood uh, mitigation in Hanoi is the outcome of the um, of the, those kind of like um, uh, recommendations uh, in order to better 
have a practice of the wastewater reuse in urban areas of Hanoi. Uh, there should be a good management uh, arrangement between among the different party and the different department in the um, in the cities. So the city people committee gonna take a lead to the district people committee and the department of agriculture for the rural and development to have a better way to uh, treat the wastewater of course and you know to um you know, to to convert it into integration uh system make sure that we have the good quality of the treated wastewater for the uh, reuse in the fishery rice and in uh, in the vegetable cultivation and also the farmers and household should be taken in taken into account with uh, some like training education to recognize the potential dangers of the wastewater reuse for agriculture with Without any recommendation from the policy maker. Um, and yeah, of course, the developing uh, an institutional arrangement and policies are very important. And we have to think how to protect the consumer by doing though, you know, we can ha have the better way to practice uh, the, the reuse of the wastewater for you know aquaculture and agriculture. Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tui, for uh, sharing with us this um, experience from Hanoi. Let me remind uh, the participants to submit your questions to the speakers uh, through the Q&A box, uh, where we will be answering them during the, the question and answer session. Uh, now, uh, before we go to the question and answer session, we will have a second poll. Uh, which is going to be um, projected on, on the screen. And I will be helping for those who are unable to go through the, the questions. I will be helping you go through them. Uh, so the second uh, poll, uh, the first question is, which of the following least describe how good practices from sanitation interventions and innovations in Asia and Africa can be further emphasized and made applicable to other regions. One, identifying knowledge gaps in sanitation. Two, sharing knowledge on successful sanitation approaches and models, strengthening international collaboration and partnerships, localizing knowledge to specific contexts, and providing technical data and materials to local communities. Which of the following list describe how those good practices can be made applicable to other regions. Question number two, capacity building is one of the key components for improvement. Which of the following least describe key factors for successful capacity building implementation? One, collaboration and networking, consider local context, one size fits all approach, avoid quick fixes, knowledge, acknowledge local knowledge. Number three, and the last one, uh, which of the following least describe the importance of data and information management for urban sanitation, uh, assessing uh, local needs, informing planning, regulation, and decision-making processes, strengthening global data collection system and national reporting, tracking progress at all levels, integrating local service data with national security. We have five minutes to answer the three questions, a single choice for each question. Please remember to post your questions on the Q&A box where our speakers can be responding to them directly and we will be taking some of them also during uh, the open discussion. Patrick, uh, if uh, we have answers already, we can start projecting the, the summary of the results. Thank you. So um, question number one, uh, we have 49% for providing technical data and materials to local communities. Uh, that means that uh, the question is well understood. So question number two, capacity building is one of the key components. So which one least describes uh, the key factors uh, that makes uh, capacity building implementation successful? One size fits all approach is the correct answer with 64%. And lastly, uh, which of the following list describes the importance of data, uh, integrating local service data with the national security? Uh, that is the, the, the least one with 63%. Uh, 
I think that really uh, clearly shows that uh, the participants uh, understand uh, the topic that uh, we are discussing today. So let me kick start the, the question and answer session uh, with uh, a few questions to the speakers. And I will start with uh, Professor Harinaivo. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, Burkina Faso is currently the only French speaking country that has introduced access to water and sanitation in its constitution. Uh, can you please tell, tell us more about uh, the, the implication of that in the field, particularly mm -hmm. for informal settlements? And number two, how can Burkina Faso or Ouagadougou municipality capitalize on the sanitation initiatives undertaken by various structures to extend services to informal settlements in the context where there is no national strategy specifically addressing these areas? Over to you, Professor. Okay, thank you very much, Ezekiel. Uh, for the question, first question, uh, as it say, as I said, so the 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 advantage of uh, including the sanitation access to the constitution has greatly uh, is the intervention of uh, international uh, organization or international. Uh, act uh, of uh, many actors who want to work on the sanitation sector in uh, in Burkina Faso. So uh, it, it has helped to to facilitate the access and to to implement projects on sanitation. So this is one of the main points because uh, it is from the constitution. So. Uh, this is one of the main points uh, regarding that. Uh, the other aspect, to see, uh, uh, I said, is the the formalization of uh, manual MPS. So, uh, following this uh, law in the constitution, there was a decree that no recognize and has also defined the, the, the role and responsibilities of each actor in the sanitation. And it was very clear maintenant the role and responsibilities uh, of actors, the funding, financing of the sanitation sector in Burkina Faso. So this is the, what I can say for the question number one. Uh, for the question number two, uh, it should be known that uh, in Burkina Faso, the, it is uh, mainly the ONEA, National Office for the Water and Sanitation, who is, uh, which is the public utility, who implement uh, the activity and also who offer, provide the services. So, uh, uh, what we can say, maybe it's not exactly what are the how the municipality can capitalize, but based on the initiative uh, taken by the ONEA in terms of uh, improving access of uh, sanitation to the population in urban areas. So, uh, and indirectly, the, the 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 municipalities can benefit from that strategy. So this is, uh, I think, my response to your question. I hope it has uh, yeah. also a no, thank you very much, Professor. I think uh, that is very clear. So uh, we go to Emmanuel. So in the Kenyan context, uh, who are the key institutions that are critical for formalization of sanitation data for planning? And uh, what are their respective roles in ensuring that data is used? Number two, uh, the Nawasco, which is the utilities responding to a wider shift uh, in Kenya where utilities are taking responsibility for on-site sanitation for the first time. What do you see as the key challenges for utilities in delivering on-site sanitation mandates? Thank you, thank you, Pire. So um, I'll start by saying that uh, Nawasco is one of the uh, utilities uh, that uh, have taken the responsibility to provide, uh, take the challenge of providing on-site sanitation. Of course, the other util utilities like Isumu Water, Malindi, and others under the oversight of WASRED. 
but uh, as you mentioned, uh, a, a number of challenges uh, still uh, can be are, are uh, can be uh, have been noticed, uh, and uh, uh, some of them, for example, is the lack of budgets. Uh, as I said, data uh, drives uh, uh, the budgeting process, particularly within the counties, and without uh, very uh, without accurate data you find the allocation of budgets, particularly in the county government budgets, which also uh, help the utilities to be able to provide those services uh, across the town, then become quite minimal. So I will say data, uh, the data being critical for the budgeting process, particularly in the context of the county integrated planning process. Now, the aspect of human resource capacity can also be mentioned in that context, particularly in, in terms of enforcement uh, which uh, is within the county government uh, so utilities uh, of course uh, can provide the services but the larger enforcement responsibility is also needed within the uh, within the county context and then the coordination nakuru has moved forward in terms of coordination with other players having a platform to do that but of course in other cities that is still not well structured as compared to Nakuru having a coordination platform called Nakostek. And then there is the first urbanizing peri-urban areas within the, uh, within the service area, which is also presenting um, uh, more needs uh, for response and, and also for service. And uh, those are some of the challenges that we, we can mention, particularly for the utilities, because WhatsApp is also doing a lot to support them in terms of regulatory uh, support, guidelines, and also technical uh, capacity strengthening. But coming again to the institutions that uh, uh, formalize the data, uh, it depends. Uh, and as I said, uh, a number of institutions are within uh, the institutional arrangements uh, of uh, sanitation services still uh, uh, attracting uh, a number of uh, players. Like, for example, at the national level, we have the regulator WASRE uh, that needs that data for monitoring of service and oversight. Uh, we have uh, the NEMA, uh, which is also uh, monitoring the quality uh, of, uh, of effluents being discharged in the sewer systems. And then we also have uh, the, 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 the quality, uh, the NAWASCO itself, or even the utilities, also monitoring the quality of effluent being discharged into their system. So all this, they can only monitor and uh, and uh, probably enforce or utilize the data if they have that accurate data being monitored across the chain. And of course, the departments uh, within the counties uh, also require this data and being uh, they are also key in validating the data. But the Department of Education for uh, when it comes to school wash, uh, they have uh, the Department of uh, Public Health also very uh, key in terms of uh, the on-site sanitation service provision. So a number of players are within that uh, uh, matrix and uh, the data, as I said, the formalization, WASREB has really played a great role in ensuring that that data is verified, validated uh, with the, the utilities and also with other players participating in that. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for those answers. So let's go to Pritum. Uh, now, seven years has passed since the regulatory framework uh, for fecal sludge uh, management uh, was implemented in Bangladesh. What are the major challenges faced in enforcement of, of this regulation, especially in the mega city like Dhaka? And uh, the second question is you mentioned that uh, uh, there are uh, the utilities are facing limitations in managing wastewater, and you also mentioned that city corporations are cleaning the canals. Could you clarify whether this indicates a shift in regulation responsibilities, or both the city, uh, or if the if both the city corporations and the utility are cooperating uh, on this task? Well, thank you, Pire, uh, and uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, yeah, seven years is passed, but uh, you know the Dhaka situation is quite complex. But if you can, if you ask me about the challenges, I think we can categorize this in in four different uh, categories. One is the policy level challenges, where uh, 
you can you can uh, talk about uh, bringing uh, the the on site sanitation or wastewater management as a national priority uh, there is a there is a uh, policy document we produce every year in bangladesh every five in every five year in bangladesh which is five year plan so now we are we are we are in a in a situation where the ninth five year plan will be introduced soon so i think uh, if if we can bring this wastewater uh, related concern under the uh, next five year plan that that can that can help uh, the sector to gain more resources from the central government and that can um, also mobilize uh, the sector uh, pretty much faster the enforcement as well and i think uh, there is a there is a very specific gap there is no uh, national nationwide regulator for sanitation so the utilities are uh, both playing the f uh, playing the role of the regulator as well as the service provider which is uh, actually creating a different kind of complications when it comes to uh, uh, i mean service delivery or whatsoever uh, unpacking the fsm uh, irf uh, the city corporations or municipalities who are in the forefront is yet to have such capacity in terms of uh, their human resource their their um, uh, financial uh, capacities and everything and they are they are not habituated to deal with small scale enterprises uh, who can enable the service to reach uh, especially to the poor people and create a competitive market uh, there is a lack of chaos there are uh, there are like number of departments working in dhaka um, some are controlling the land use some are controlling the environment some are controlling the uh, drains some are the sewerage some are some are the uh, commercial buildings and and some of the hospitals so it's is quite a, uh, difficult to bring everyone i think coordination is one of the biggest challenges uh, when it comes to enforcement and finally the citizens you can see that the, I, I mentioned that 63% of the people are are of migrants uh, these most of the people almost 80% of the people are different kind of climate climate migrants like uh, coming from different part of bangladesh especially the coastal areas so when each and every time new people are keeping keep coming in the city is really very difficult to orient them that how to manage their waste how to use the shared facilities and and blah 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 so i think this is a this is something uh, really very challenging uh, especially when they have a toilet or a specific arrangement with uh, connected to the drain they are not willing to invest they are not uh, able to invest they cannot afford it to to uh, redo this uh, uh, non standards or containment and, and so whatsoever and here we come to the second uh, question that yeah i mean uh, there is a in in 2020 end of 2020 the last quarter of 2020 there is an interesting uh, shift happens in the in the landscape uh, uh, there was a challenge that a uh, city corporation was the pub, was uh, run by the public representatives and dhaka was uh, was uh, the owner of the canals and main drains but that, that this has been shifted and uh, now the city corporations are managing it and they are very close to the people so uh, and and we can see the positive changes and uh, mostly like uh, public awareness uh, campaigns and and engaging people uh, to to ensure the better management of wastewater and especially uh, uh, creating a pressure to the uh, building owners uh, to to stop illegal uh, disposal and this is happening just because the public representatives are now in control so this is a positive shift and dhaka now the canals and main drains are now uh, managed by the public representatives in dhaka uh, i think uh, that that answers yeah. no no thank you very much uh, pritum i think i think that is clear so let's go to tui now in order to put a policy on wastewater reuse uh, into practice in hanoi what would be your recommendation and then number two, um, what is your thought about the uh, sustainable urban drainage systems implementation uh, at certain areas in Hanoi to handle other areas that are still affected by the flood? What about the international effort uh, to support Hanoi managing uh, water resources for, for flood mitigation? Oh, thank you, Pirea. Uh, for question number one, in order to 
uh, put uh, the policy into practice for the case study of Hanoi uh, in terms of the wastewater reuse, I think uh, I'm going to recommend uh, like there should be a good you know agreement between the technologies and the reuse requirements, especially we should focus on the end users because end user can uh, give us a feedback how the uh, how they're gonna you know get the benefit from the wastewater reuse uh, during you know consumption of the uh, agriculture or agriculture like products. And it is advised that the two pronged approach should be uh, considered to overcome the mismatch between the you know, treatment technologies and the reuse requirement. For example, the local engineers, the planners, the decision makers uh, need to be technically knowledgeable to, pro to provide the good and the proper treatment system for the each requirement based on the wastewater reuse proposed. And in on uh, in addition, the donor, the farmers, the owners, uh, or the contractor should be adapted with the various technologies and the financial support, and they should be very flexible to accept the new technology, simple technology, but very good uh, treatment uh, efficacies. Um, and there should be you know, a good and a clear recommendation, recom uh, regulation on treated wastewater quality for reuse requirement because the effluent is going to be reused in the aquacultures and agriculture. So the regulation recommendation on the quality of the effluent is really important. And we should get the farmer in the technical policy trainings on the wastewater reuse uh, to make sure that they have uh, the combi uh, they have the combination between the new technologies and the guidelines, the safe reuse guidelines with their you know practice as a traditional ways. You know, combine them together to have a better you know wastewater reuse um, uh, capacities for their aquaculture and agricultures. So that is for number one, the recommendation on putting the policy into the wastewater reuse in, for the case study of Hanoi. Uh, for the question number two, uh, the sustainable urban drainage system implementation in the certain areas uh, to handle the arrow, uh, other areas that are still affected by flood. Uh, actually, uh, in my presentation, I already introduced you know, some um, uh, solution for the sustainable urban drainage system, meaning that the existing uh, rainwater harvesting system in micro and medium scales are mostly demo projects. So the outcome from those projects are really you know, meaningful, showing that the mitigation of the local flooding in the city is the outcome. So it's really helpful. Um, and yeah, you know, we can you know promote those kind of demo projects in other city, uh, in other like you know areas in Hanoi to make sure that you know the different location of Hanoi, especially the uh, the the sixty key you know flooding location in Hanoi, can be able to handle the flood. Um, also for the new urban area, I believe that recently there are a lot of like attention on separate uh, on building the separate sewer rig system and also um, constructing the decentralized wastewater uh, uh, treatment system uh, to reduce the loading you know, to the combined sewer rig and drainage system also to make sure that we don't you know overflow and over like polluted loading to the centralized system. This one gonna be very helpful uh, for the flood mitigation for the cities. However, the street, as you can see on the photo from my, you know, the, 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 the first slide in presentation, the streets in the city are still turning into the river when heavy rains. So it demonstrates that the um, the, inequality, the, 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 the inequality between the sustainable urban drainage system uh, implementation and overloading uh, wastewater stormwater infrastructures are still there. So it requires more effort to implement a uh, sustainable urban drainage system in Hanoi, because still we spend a lot of effort, spend a lot of money on mitigate the flood in Hanoi, but still, you know, when we have the heavy rain, we still see some, you know, the streets and some like certain areas, especially the 16 uh, key location in Hanoi still su uh, suffering from the flooding. Um, yeah, there are a lot of you know the international uh, international effort uh, in both the technical solution and the soft measures supporting Hanoi to measure uh, to to manage the water resources for flood mitigation. For example, in two thousand and nineteen, one bank commissioned 
to undertake a study on the water pollution control in like four key rivers of Hanoi uh, to have a better water quality, to have a better flow, and to you know control the solid waste from the resources. And yeah, this study also focused on the wastewater management in two key locations, which are suffering from very, very severe flood in Hanoi. Uh, in 2010 or 11, I believe, uh, an ODA project funded by Japanese government on building the you know, large flood pumping station to mitigate the flood in Hanoi, uh, make sure that we you know, pump all the storm water um, uh, through this uh, flood uh, pumping station. However, it is not yet full capacity, so the city is still affected by the, by the flood. Um, some other demon, uh, demo, demonstration projects on the rainwater harvesting system supported by the Korea partners has been conducted in Hanoi, especially focusing on the community-based um, level uh, to uh, to harvest the rainwater for the multi-purpose. One is uh, for flood mitigation, and uh, the second one is like for water supplies. Uh, for water supply, and the third one is like for groundwater recharges. So we have, you know, a lot of the effort from the international organization to help it uh, in terms of the technical solution, in terms of the soft measures, yeah, you know, to uh, prevent the flood for the case study of Hanoi. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I think that is that is very clear. Now to wrap up uh, this segment uh, of Q and A with with our speakers, uh, let me turn to our keynote uh, speaker Abhishek. Um, now you identified uh, in your uh, keynote that um, there are certain key issues that have gained prominence that need to be incorporated uh, into the CY's approach. Issues around climate, uh, sanitation workers, and and integration. Uh, has has uh, the um, research institutions like IWAG started thinking about uh, this uh, the need to integrate uh, this uh, um, you know new new issues coming up uh, that 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 will impact uh, CY's approach absolutely uh, so i think uh, as more and more evidence starts to emerge uh, whether it's on climate change uh, and how it impacts and is affected by uh, sanitation. So it's it's not just uh, the the adaptation aspects of sanitation, but also how sanitation by itself contributes to climate change and how do we mitigate that. So that, I think just in the last two years, we've seen a lot of evidence that has been coming out. And there's even been uh, um, sort of uh, a coalition called the Climate Resilient Sanitation Coalition that has been formed with also a diverse set of uh, stakeholders who are now trying to create a, a, a more coherent understanding of all these different pieces of evidence that have been emerging. Similarly, for sanitation workers, uh, of course, Water Aid, World Bank, ILO, and several others have been working on this front. And, and I think sanitation workers is not a, an issue that is quite recent. I think it's one of the most uh, uh, important and uh, issues that has remained over the last several decades. But now we're starting to see more clear understanding of what can we do and 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 finding good evidence of what sort of things work and uh, real case studies across the world where uh, 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 new technological uh, interventions which can support sanitation workers to, uh, and, and help protect their safety and dignity kind of emerge. In the same way, I think integration is another key topic that has uh, um, been something that uh, AWAG has been working on, but also several other uh, research institutions looking at how do we plan things synergistically? Are we planning for integration or are we doing integrated planning and trying to answer some of these questions and trying to understand what, what is the political economy aspect? What are the real benefits of doing integrated planning and, and so on? And I think as we start to understand some of these complex topics better, uh, we should think of CYs as a living concept, not something that is set in stone, which uh, uh, you know, which we cannot go and edit, but something that as a sector we keep alive and integrate each of these different uh, um, new findings and new evidence into the CYs concept. So I, ho I hope that answers your, your your question briefly. No, thank you very much. I think uh, it's very clear, Abhishek. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think the Q and A box uh, has also been uh, very active. Uh, we have received uh, ten questions and nine uh, have been answered. 
and I see that um, uh, the last one is also being answered. Uh, so I think that uh, participants are also um, uh, going into the Q and A box to to check on on those answers, and I will not uh, uh, take time to to read each and every one of them. Uh, so let us uh, now close um, the meeting, um, and uh, I I want to I I I don't want to to try and recap. Uh, the rich discussions that um, uh, we have had in, in this session, uh, but some points stand out. One is that, um, like uh, Abhishek says, most of the research and knowledge has been documented so far uh, on, on uh, is issues around institutions, regulations, and planning for CYs, uh, but major gaps still remain on the impact of CYs on, on public and environmental health uh, that needs a little more research, uh, how the mix of technologies can be chosen and governed, and, and key issues that, that are gaining prominence that need to be incorporated, including climate change and issues around sanitation workers and, and integration. We also saw from the example from Ouagadougou, uh, three initiatives and, and models for extending sanitation services uh, to informal settlements, uh, subsidizing household latrines and, and introducing movable latrine models which have revolutionized uh, sanitation in five informal settlements uh, in Ouagadougou. Uh, the ONEA's private provider approach and also uh, the, the budgetary support uh, from KFW uh, that has enabled the, the utility there uh, to take innovative approaches to improve sanitation services in informal settlements. Uh, now, uh, the um, issue around city level institutional and regulatory reforms to clarify responsibilities in Dhaka, Bangladesh, is also a very good example of how to clarify responsibilities for enforcement of contain, containment standards for on-site sanitation systems and also for uh, stopping the direct connection of content, containment structures to surface drains. Uh, we also heard from Nakuru the, the need for centralized data management within the utility uh, that has happened leading to improved service planning and, and lastly, we've heard from Hanoi the management arrangements for wastewater management in peri-urban peri areas and also sustainable urban drainage uh, system implementation for flood mitigation and pollution control. Uh, before I end, uh, there are a few uh, slides uh, which I, I also want to bring to the attention of the, the participants, particularly the upcoming IWA webinars and events. Uh, so uh, on the 27th of June, uh, 2024, there will be a webinar on water security, inclusivity and the SDGs. And then um, the next one, yes. Uh, there will also be a, a web, uh, sorry, um, the 19th IWA Leading Edge Conference on Water and Wastewater Technologies uh, that is happening in, in Germany. Uh, the deadline has been extended to, to 5th of January, uh, closing the water cycle through efficient and innovative technologies. Uh, there is the World, Water Cong the, the World Water Congress and Exhibition uh, that is happening in Toronto, Canada from the 11th and, and 15th August 2024, and uh, participants are encouraged to register for that. And then lastly, if you want to join the IWA network of water professionals, you can use the code on the screen and join before the 31st December 2024 at the www.iwaconnect.org. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for taking your time uh, to be with us for the 90 minutes. I think it has been rewarding. And thank you very much also to our speakers. And we hope to see you in the next IWA webinar. Thank you and bye. <laughs>